All right, welcome everyone um, to this session of the Oklahoma Council for Social Studies uh, 2020-2021 virtual conference. Um, this session is on cultural diversity and diverse representation in the classroom. Um, my name is Todd Gragg. I am an OCSS board member. I'm in the National Council delegate on our board currently. And I, this year, am serving as the instructional technology coach district-wide for Seminole Public Schools, as well as teaching one hour of U.S. government in, um, to 10th graders in the afternoon. So glad all of you are here. I will give both of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Hill from OU had um, something come up and was not able to make it tonight, but we do have two wonderful, um, brilliant panelists, and I will let them introduce themselves as well. Um, I guess I'll go first and I'm going to show my husband that because you said I was brilliant. Oh. And <laughs> um, my name is Natasha Jefferson. I am a first grade educator. I am in Clinton, Oklahoma, which is Western Oklahoma. I'm entering into my sixth year and I have on um, all of those six years I've been in first grade. So i um, excited to be here and speak with everybody and do some learning. Hi, I'm Vanessa Perez, and I am currently an Educational Technology Specialist and the District Library Coordinator at Lawton Public Schools. In my previous life, I have been a teacher and a librarian at secondary. All right. Um, first question, why is cultural representation necessary in today's classrooms? Effort. Okay. Um, for me, um, I think it's necessary because we value what we see. And so as someone who grew up in a predominantly white, um, I grew up in Arkansas, went to a predominantly white school all my life. Um, so I, it took a really long time for me to understand my own value. And so students, we, as educators, we have to show um, our students that they mean something to us and whether or not they your, your entire class could be predominantly one race or culture, but we still have to show those others um, because it's important for them to, to see value in others as well. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and add to that, particularly in the context of a social studies classroom where so much of our, what we teach in the Western curriculum is hegemony, um, where you have one, culture or group dominating over the others, how can you leave out those cultures, um, like their, their perspective and their viewpoint when that, when this, so much of history is the struggle or, or interaction of cultures, you have to address that the cultures exist. They can't just be seen um, in, in one light or from one perspective. I think Tasha also hit the nail on the head if um, education is about connections and about relationships, um, your students have to be able, you have to be able to have a relationship with your students and help them build connections to that history. And you cannot do that if you ignore cultural representation. I feel like I should have a time buzzer. Buzzer. Um, I think that's wonderful. I would just kind of add in just from my perspective as well, as a member of kind of the dominant race and gender for most of America's history, especially teaching um, U.S. history and, and then as well as in U.S. government right now, two diverse populations. When I was in Midwest City, um, very diverse population in the high school and even here in Seminole, I have um, quite a few Native students. Um, it's important for them to hear from someone that looks like me that the actions in America's history haven't always been the best and to say that there, we can do better and that we can treat people better um, because that's not necessarily the story they may be getting if they just read the textbook or um, in other classes. But so they need to be able to hear that, yes, there is a better way that we can um, be as country and be a group of people. Um, next question. Um, what happens when only one culture is primary, primarily represented in the classroom? 
I think it goes back to what Vanessa said, sorry, um, that perspective. Uh, it's important to make sure we're not leaving out someone's voice. So uh, oftentimes we hear, you know, we have these traditional stories of the first Thanksgiving. We have, you know, Dr. King um, and whose voice, whose story is not being told when we tell it in this way where, you know, um, the pilgrims and the Native Americans came together and, and they had this wonderful feast. Well, that's not accurate. Um, it's, it's really just a bold, bold lie, to be quite honest. And so Anytime we're telling a story, it's important to, to make sure we're representing all these cultures, because if not, we're leaving someone's voice out and we're depriving them of, of having a chance to tell their truth. I think Tasha hit the nail on the head with the word truth. Um, I mean, what's the point of education is for, for our students to learn to be better and how are they learning if they're not learning the truth? If what they're learning is, you know, the old, trope is, um, you know, history is written by the victors. If, if, Hector, if history is written by the victors and they are the only ones whose side is being told, then we're not telling the whole truth. Um, so they're not really, we, we're not really teaching and the students aren't learning. Um, Oh, I think you're muted, Todd. But I can say if we have a second, a little bit more to that, I um, have a Filipino background, or I am Filipino. And so we have a very complicated history with Americans and with Spanish due to colonization. And I just think it's really interesting that I've been on TikTok lately with like, much younger like Gen Z kids who are Filipino. And you hear a lot about those Filipino kids learning all the things that American um, Filipino immigrants, things that we thought like, oh, why is my last name Perez? My answer is colonization. But a lot of people in the past and in the past, I thought, oh, it's because I have Spanish ancestry. And then to find out, no, the majority of us don't have Spanish last names because of Spanish ancestry. The majority of us have a Spanish last names because it was a Spanish procedure where there was a list of names and you had to, you were named, you were given a name according to Spanish policies. I guess that's just an example. That's really good. Um, Kind of follow up to that is then how can we as educators ensure that the diversity diversity of our students are better reflected in our content and in our teaching? Um, I try to I try to always and I think this came back from a, a teaching tolerance um, workshop I went to. I try to ask whose voice is not being heard, and so that's the first the first question I try to ask myself. Um, am I just telling my side or am I just telling a side that I learned whose voice isn't being heard? But then also um, we make sure that in our the materials that we seek, the books that are on our shelves, the pictures on our walls, um, all of those things must be diverse and it needs to be natural. It doesn't need to be like, here's my books of all the African-American people. And here's, I mean, it just has to be a part of their everyday. They pick up books. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking for early elementary. I'm speaking for first grade and pre-K and kinder. Um, we make sure that the materials that we use are natural. Naturally, we're picking up books that just kids can see themselves in it or they see someone that looks different from themselves. That should be automatic. Um, the library, lib your in-classroom library is one of those things that I always start with. Um, and then when you're, and when you're presenting or when you're giving information, when you're teaching kids, then you're always constantly asking who, who is not, who is not being heard in this, in this story, um, whose voice is being left out and try to correct that. Not just know it, but correct it. <laughs> so. He's saying Tasha's right, but she is. So it, the inclusion of your students to have in your curriculum of your students that representation, I think a lot of that can come through teaching your students critical thinking skills. If 
you are truly teaching critical thinking, that means they also get to be critical of you and what you're teaching and the materials they're giving. And then those questions should flow with the whose voice is being heard, whose voice is being amplified, whose voice is being left out, whose voice is being silenced. What do you notice? What do you wonder? I think if you are open and your kids are critically thinking, it opens the doors to inclusion. Just to jump on that, I love the, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Those are like my favorite questions to ask. Cause you're amazed. I'm always, I'm, I'm always, I'm constantly amazed at what they come up with because it's not something that I would have thought of. Um, you're gonna have at least one or two kiddos who are just gonna like blow your mind with what do you wonder and what do you notice questions. I would love to cite whoever came up with that because it's, it's such an open-ended question. One of the things that's been impactful for me as an educator is to learn from my students. Um, as someone that grew up in an area that was rather diverse in southeastern Oklahoma, but none of that diversity was ever reflected in the classroom and um, in college as well, learning from my students has been big. I'm giving them projects to do and then learning who they pick and who they research and what matters to them has opened my eyes to um, people I had never heard of and that have been very impactful. Um, Madam Walker with um, uh, Hare and some others that are just really um, phenomenal people and have done a lot for civil rights and a lot for diversity, um, but really weren't ever exposed in my upbringing. Um, but to actually learn what's important to them, I think is important. Um, and then to not only stop, but stop there, but to continue to grow. Um, for me, it's let my students at times point out my blind spots and point out where I need to grow and learn um, as a non-diverse educator um, to become better at helping with them. So um, how does diverse representation and teaching in a way that, um, amplifies diversity, um, how does it aid in pushing back against white supremacy? That critical thinking skills, again, if you are used to questioning things, you're going to question the foundations of our curriculum, which are based in white supremacy. If you're used to questioning things, if you're trained to in interrogate, you're going to question why things that are they the way they are sound so circular um i think you know uh after the civil war the daughters of the confederacy very famously and effectively went into schools to push the curriculum of um the Confederacy is kind of a lost, nostalgic, romantic uh, heritage um, through monuments and curriculum and ritual. And if you don't know how to think critically, you're never gonna address why, are, why is social studies structured the way it is? Why do we learn those things? Um, when I went to, when I was in school and when I was in college, I was a, I got a history degree and I was a classicist. Like I was like into classical Latin. I was enamored of everything like Greek and Roman. And I never really questioned why I was so enamored of those things. And I think that goes back to, well, that's what I was taught in, in grade school. I was taught that Western civilization you know, and leading into American was the best and most fascinating. And so until I got older, I never really learned about the rest of the world, even though I was studying, you know, as, you know, history throughout the, the physical world, I wasn't, I was not looking at it through a lens that wasn't Western. Um, but when I became more critical, um, of Western civilization and the Western school system, that's when I started to really look at 
uh, other cultures and civilizations. You said it so well, um, and it goes back to what you've been saying. Sorry, we keep we just work so well together, Chris. I'll just say, but um, it goes back to what you what you've been saying is that you have to think critically, um, and we can't do that if we are using one lens and one perspective all the time. Um, and like I said, I grew up predominantly white, and so I, I I mean that's that's how I viewed the world was through that same lens, and that's not the lens that pertain to me um, and I and I just was not open or did not realize how as you said there's so much more out there and so when you start um, taking in some different viewpoints and some different cultures and you you know you, you see things that in a completely different way um, and I for college I mean it, it took me getting to college before I was just really um, open to to other things and saw other viewpoints within the school setting within social studies. Um, so, I mean, it just definitely is so important to have a different view. That, I'm gonna go back to what I was saying with Western viewpoint, well, like a lot of the time with the way that I was taught um, American history and world history, there was so much white saviorism in that. And I didn't really understand how it affected um, indigenous and people of color when you're made to kind of feel like, well, dang, my people didn't contribute anything. We didn't, you know, have lasting civil empires. We didn't contribute to great discoveries. And you, that's, and so like, how am I going to do anything? What good could I possibly bring to the world? if I'm not white and European. Um, I mean, that sounds so dumb and naive to me now, but that's- But it's so that's, true. Yeah. That's what you get when you're, that's how you're brought up. Yeah. Agree with that a hundred percent. The amount of black inventors and scientists and those things that I did not know until later in life, I mean, I'm an adult and, um, you know, just the water gun, like, you know, just something as simple as a water gun, who that was, in, I mean, just those things, if you just don't understand the value it is for kids, especially young kids to see themselves um, as scientists and mathematicians and artists. And I mean, it's just, it's so valuable. It's so valuable to see that. And I think that's important from especially a world history and um, world geography viewpoint as well. I look back um, and kind of the story of my world history in high school. Um, I had a coach in uh, 10th grade for world history. Um, I was the only one in his student to read. I think I had like right after lunch, had a class, um, full class. I was the only student that made an A on the first test. And the coach came up to me and said, I can't teach you anything. You have an A for the rest of the year. You can go to the library every day. And that's how I had world history. And then in college, I went to a private Baptist school that taught a very, had a big Western civilization program, but taught it from a very Western white viewpoint. And when I started teaching world history and AP world history, I started to really learn a lot more. I'd studied some on my own, but really started to learn and have conversations with my students. Um, we think we're, you know, and we are a good country. Um, but even if you trace us back in Western heritage, back to the Greek and Roman days, this has been going on for roughly 2,000 years. China had dynasties that lasted much longer than that. Egypt had dynasties that lasted much longer. And you can see that there are people from other parts of the world that look much different that have been able to do amazing things as well. And I would always bring up with my students, even as I moved with them from world history up to APUS, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a lot of the um, Islamic scholars moving from the Middle East through Northern Africa into Spain, um, helping them navigate the stars, helping them um, take long voyages, um, helping spur scientific revolution. They really help usher into or usher the Europe um, out of the middle or dark ages 
and, and into um, a new time of light and scientific discovery and philosophical revolution. And, and so it's you've got to teach that part. And that's got to be critical for students to understand that it takes all of us to build a great society and to contribute. Um, it can't just be one race. It can't just be one gender. Um, it takes learning from other people. <clears throat> All right, how should an educator um, respond to the recent events of January 6th in ways which are responsive to the, to the diversity in their classroom? I think there's um, a balance and a line there where teachers can't be partisan. But that doesn't mean we can't be political or we can't address politics and current events. Um, you know, for several reasons. One, because especially with social studies, our, our student, where else are you going to address current events? But also because our kids in the world, and if school were not giving them space and time and opportunities to process what's going on in their world. It, it's like Maslow's, like how are you going to expect them to learn whatever standard you're going on today if you're gonna completely ignore what's going on? You have to address or at least give them the opportunity in space and time to address January 6th. Um, to do otherwise, is giving the message of silence and just ignoring it. And ignoring it is not neutrality either. It's one of my favorite things, ignoring is not neutrality. Um, even in first grade, our kids are aware that something happened and people are angry and people are sad. And so you can address that age appropriately. I saw lots and lots of teachers um, across Facebook that were like, I'm not touching it with a six foot pole. Um, and I don't understand why not. I mean, kids are, kids are extremely smart and whether their parents have conversations with them or they're just hearing it, they are aware that something is going on. And so you can talk about different um, emotions that people were feeling that day and, um, and have a real conversation with kids and still, it can still be age appropriate. And you can, um, you know, I mean, I just, you just cannot ignore, you just can't ignore it. Um, our kids are affected by the decisions that are being made outside of their home. Um, especially Clinton is pretty diverse. I think we're at 55% Hispanic or 51% Hispanic population. And um, so, I mean, these are the things that are going on are affecting their households, um, whether their parents are having, you know, frank conversations or not, but we cannot ignore as educators, we cannot, we cannot ignore um, because you are telling that child that they just need to bottle that emotion in, save it for later. And that's, it's, uh, can be detrimental. I think too, like if kid, kids know what are going, what's going on in the world. And if you see that and your kid's not talking about it, or your, your kid, your teacher's not talking about it. As a kid, the kids are thinking, well, what else are they ignoring? What else are they not teaching me or telling me the truth about? Nicole, I'm looking at your message and I, I mean, that's definitely a great segue. Um, and that's kind of how we talked about in our classes, you know, cause we've, we've already been discussing some things all year long, but we had been discussing Dr. King and peaceful protesting. And so then you can discuss um, what do you wonder, what do you see about this, the protest that may have been different with, you know, on January 6th and then things that we saw um, previously. And, you know, uh, the reasons behind what was Dr. King trying to change? What are things that these, you know, this group is trying to change? And, you know, just some of those different things. I think, I mean, I think that's a great um, conversation that in a great way that, you know, you had a kiddo bring that up, but that's a great way to segue into that conversation.
Right. Uh, Vanessa, anything to add on that last question? Um, not, not at this moment. I'm trying to guess so much to say. I do think um, it's one of the thought I had is it is important to discuss that. I, I remember I was a junior in high school when the murder bombing happened and teachers discussed that in class. Um, we did nothing but discuss it and talk about it for the rest of the week. Um, I'm sure it was very similar. I was in college when 9-11 happened, but I'm sure for those in still in high school and lower, that was discussed. That was talked about. Teachers didn't ignore it. Um, but I think in a similar sense, this was one of those moments that people will always remember. And as educators, we can't ignore that that happened. We can't not discuss it. And we can't hide the truth from our students either. Um, they need to, we need to be careful and be part, um, nonpartisan in it, but also um, share hard truths with them when it's necessary. Um, we are gonna open it up um, to questions from the group now. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask, you can unmute yourself and ask, and we will um, give a few moments for that. I had kind of a question or just like advice and tips. I work in a rural school, and so I'm um, in grad school. A lot of times it's like, uh, like have the kids speak their experiences or like share their cultures. But um, I work in like a rural school where we're predominantly white. And so like there are not those um, different cultures. Like they're all white kids who hunt and fish, you know? So um, how do I like introduce them in other ways to um, people who are different than them that don't hunt and fish and don't live in the country that um, look different than them? So I know like a lot of times reading books too is a big thing. Um, but just, I don't know if there's like any other ideas or tips. I think that might be one where it's better to maybe have more of a historical wax museum situation where you have an inclusive set of significant figures that you can ask students to research and emulate. Um, otherwise, because if you tell them to look up to, to research or represent a country or a culture, you then are in danger of possibly doing the, my country, you know, my culture is a costume and inviting a lot of stereotypes. Whereas if you picked or had representatives that may be a better way to introduce culture because the cultural dress would be, you know, there's a difference between dressing up like Frida Kahlo and then saying, I'm going to represent the country of Mexico. And then that's inviting a lot of stereotypes. Um, also, um, just there are a lot of like um, rural students, like there's, a, Tasha had mentioned growing populations of rural students being um, Latinx or Mexican due to migrations. And so some of the most country kids you find will be Mexicans who hunt and fish. And if you give them specific, I said significant figures, like I give them a bank, but also say, hey, if there's someone else you want to look into, maybe be open to that. But if they're making connections that way, um, they'll find some, some commonality. Um, I would also specifically mention, uh, Tasha had mentioned Teaching Tolerance. Um, their website is tolerance.org and they have so many good um, ideas and trainings and they have a, to where you can kind of, if you don't have access, they're not doing live trainings right now, but you can research some things for yourself. Um, does that help? Yeah, thank you. And they also have lessons on there as well. So like if you are wanting to, you know, um, teach about identity or diversity, then you can go in there, put your specific grade level and it'll pull up different lesson ideas. Um, and I, I love everything that Vanessa said, and I'm going to add on um, one thing that I did that a, a lot of my kids loved is that we, um, we blogged 
on Seesaw with another classroom that was in Mexico. Um, and so, I mean, just trying to make those connections. And so, um, or we, and we use Flipgrid. So we would read the same book and then we'd get on Flipgrid and share, you know, what we thought about the book. Um, so if you can reach out to other classrooms, I would, I mean, I would encourage that even if you don't have a lot of technology or if you do have technology, it's even better. But if you don't have a lot, a lot of technology, you can still make that possible. Um, and sometimes we would have um, Google Hangouts. It was Hangouts. It's been a while since I've done one. So now it would be Zooms, but we, and we would hang out with another classroom. Um, and so we may just kind of share some things about uh, where we lived and they would share some things about what, where they lived and then they would share like their classroom and things like that. So um, we learned a lot about different classrooms that way as well. I hope that helped a little bit. You also specifically mentioned books. Um, and I just want to have some, some kind of caveats there. I'm going to put my librarian hat on. Um, if you're not with, familiar with it, look up the term own voices. Um, a lot of the time it's hashtag, so like no space between them. And because it's so tempting when you're wanting to have an inclusive library or um, to just kind of, it almost becomes an audit or a checklist. And there, there are things, there are nuances that you can miss, but it's important to look at known voices because you don't just want representation of, let's say, like your Native American students. You don't just want to pick any book that has Native American students. Um, you would prefer to have books by Native American authors about Native American lives and stories. So that's own voices will help you find those. Thank you. I just took a grad school class on multicultural children's literature. So nice. I am glad to have that reminder too. What other questions um, do we have for tonight? I did um, put the link to teachingtolerance.org in the chat. Um, it is a wonderful resource, um, very great stuff from there. Um, also, I'll put it again, the link to the um, attendance um, Google form and if you get your PD credit. Um, um, I just, if, if we don't have questions, I did want to add some more resources, and I'll put the, those in there too. But um, the Zen Education Project is a really good one. Um, they do teaching people's history, um, and then facing history yourselves. They do some really good work, and. Uh, they have some specific resources about talk, talk, uh, talking about the attacks on the Capitol. Oh, oh man, I'm just gonna talk some more yeah, now. Go, go right ahead. Um, so I just wanted to address also, we talked about uh, like directly about cultural diversity, but I also want to talk about the importance of inclusion with LGBTQ um, because they are a part of our history. And if you exclude um, LGBTQ people, um, you know, as figures in history or as part of the civil rights movement, then why are we excluding them? Because it's controversial. Um, maybe, but then what are you saying to your students, your students who are LGBTQ? They're, they're going to ask, well, where am I in history? Is my life so controversial that we can't talk about it in school? Why can't we talk about this? I just wanted and to- And for our small towns, for our small towns, that's the hardest 
I found that that's probably the hardest thing to talk about is the LGBTQ community. Um, and I mean, even in first grade, I mean, we've gotten pushed back on some of the selections, the literature selections that we have, um, that I have in the classroom, but it's, impo it's important and it's valuable. Um, so it's, that's especially tough for some of our, our communities or smaller communities for sure. And I think on that one, I think we have to remember that part of, be, part of education is creating safe spaces for our kids to learn. And, and part of that is feeling included. And, and so there does need to be a sense on our part that we're trying to protect them um, and, and also help them see themselves. You know, as Vanessa was talking, I was thinking um, Dr. King's daughter um, put out a statement yesterday um, that I saw several people post on Twitter and Facebook about reminding that not everybody liked Dr. King when he was alive. Um, he had at one point over 67% of America that disapproved of his methods and disapproved of what he was trying to do. Um, he was controversial. So yes, in some of our small towns, LGBT um, history and civil rights history may be seen as controversial today, but that doesn't mean it will be tomorrow. And most educators that I know, we would prefer to be on the right side of history. And, and this is a time for us to choose that, I believe. Um, but it is important to share um, those histories. And um, there are one really great place to find some of that history um, in a very, um, I think, honest way is on some podcasts um, that I've listened to that have been very um, forthright in some of the um, protests and riots that happened both in San Francisco and in New York City um, in the LGBT communities in the past 50 years. And letting our students know that that's there, um, that they can learn from that, I think is important um, because it goes back to creating that safe place um, where students feel included and that their identity and um, history matters. Um, one resource I'm going to drop into the chat is a book um, entitled History in the Making. Um, it's a fascinating book um, that Amazon sells out of quite a bit, but it's looking at how his U.S. history textbooks have changed over the past 200 years. Um, and on a lot of issues, it will take a textbook from different time periods and actually pay, uh, like next to each other on a page, show how that telling has been changed over time. Um, so especially when looking at how the Civil War has been changed and how it's been taught, um, how the Texas Revolution has been changed and how it's been taught, and, and things like that, and really breaking that down. Um, sure. All right, any other questions or comments or even best practices from your own classrooms to share? All right, I want to um, thank uh, both Ms. Perez and Ms. Jefferson for their time tonight and give them each a, time, a chance to kind of say a few concluding remarks that they would like. Um, and also thank you for attending. Um, do you think information they provided has been, I've taken several notes tonight and it's been really um, invaluable information. I'll just say um, thank you guys. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, but I also appreciate always um, meeting with others and um, just discussing and learning and growing and all of that. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And I agree with what Tasha said. And also just acknowledge that um, 
there's been a lot of work like i feel like we're we've been speaking on this topic but there's been a lot of work internal work um critical uh, reflection of self to get to this point and it's ongoing it's always going on we make mistakes we we know better we do better but you've got to learn more about yourself before we can try to do these things with kids thank you also for the opportunity thank you all right thank you all for being here tonight and i hope all of you have a wonderful evening <laughs>